Heavenly Father, as we begin this morning to continue on in this series, we ask that uh, you would help us to convey this information in a clear and understandable way. We ask for the presence of your Holy Spirit here and now and your angels, and we ask that um, you would honor this information and accompany it wherever it may go on uh, the recordings that we're doing to, to empower it there as well as here. And uh, as this be the preparation day, we ask that um, what we are going to do today would be done in a productive, timely manner uh, that we can all be prepared to enter into your Sabbath as you would have us do in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> We're now at the, the point in our series where we are going to start dealing more specifically with the 1843 chart. We spent the first six or seven um, presentations trying to um, demonstrate that the logic that the pioneers of Adventism, the men and women that used and pre presented this chart during the Millerite time period, that their logic concerning the, the truths that are contained in the books of Daniel and Revelation was sound and that it also has bearing on the correct understanding of prophecy here at the end of the world. Um, we dealt with the first few presentations with the fact that one of the premier um, foundation stones that the pioneers built their prophetic understanding upon, the daily in the book of Daniel, that here at the end of the world, uh, we as God's people predominantly, almost way beyond the simple majority, the majority of us are teaching something totally the opposite than what the pioneers understood. It happens to be a subject where Sister White said the pioneers were correct. So what that means um, is very important to understand. The different um, themes that are in the book of Daniel that were understood by the pioneers, we went over them a few times. Um, they understood that Rome was the power in the book of Daniel that established the vision. They also understood that Rome, it came in two phases, and that these two phases represent two desolating powers. And sure enough, history confirms that both pagan Rome and papal Rome were persecuting powers. So we've put that in place, and uh, then in our last presentation yesterday where I had, if you have the syllabus, you'll realize that maybe I covered about 60% of the notes on that particular presentation yesterday, the final presentation that presentation was a summarization of a six-part presentation in uh, Boise, Idaho, uh, where it is very clearly established in inspiration that the Millerite time period, particularly from August 11th, 1840, to October 22nd, 1844, that experience, that history, those events, are repeated to the very letter at the end of the world. And there are many important understandings that we draw from that history when we come down to the end of the world and we start looking for the things that are going to be repeated. And it's at this point, uh, based upon that premise, that we are suggesting that one of the primary components in the Millerite time period was the, the development of this chart and the truths that are contained upon this chart. Uh, the Millerites... We read yesterday they brought this chart forth because the Lord convicted them uh, from a passage in Habakkuk 2 that says, write the vision and make it plain. And from that passage, passage in Habakkuk 2, the Millerites uh, were convicted to prepare this chart. And they prepared the chart before the first disappointment. And, uh, but they understood this chart was a manifestation of or a fulfillment of Habakkuk 2, and then after the first disappointment, the first time period that William Miller thought that the Lord was going to return, they realized that right there in Habakkuk 2 where they had found the information to prepare this chart, that it talks very specifically about a tarrying time, and that they knew full well, we've been recommending a book to you um, that deals with the Millerite time period. We have some here available, and uh, if you would bring me one of those books, Kathy, I'll put it up where it can be on the video, people can see it. Uh, in that book, it's very clearly documented that the Millerites understood that they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins 
in that history. It wasn't an afterthought. This, this is a book by Gerhard Damsteed. He's a professor at Andrews University, and this is the book that he uses for the course where he goes over the history of the Millerite time period. It's called The Foundations of the Seventh-day Adventist Message and Mission. A very important book, very important book. When Sister White says the parable of the ten virgins has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, and this is the, the book in Adventism that most specifically identifies the history leading up to, during, and after the Millerite time period, then you realize the significance of this book because that history is prefiguring our history. And he documents that the Millerites understood they were fulfilling the parable of the ten virgins. So after the first disappointment, they realized that part of the parable of the ten virgins was the tarrying time. And then they realized that Habakkuk 2, the passage that had convicted them to prepare this chart, has in it the very uh, tarrying time that they found themselves in. But let's, let's start on page 73 of your syllabus, Sermon 8, the 1843 chart. I have seen that the 1843 chart was directed by the hand of the Lord, and it should not be altered that the figures were as he wanted them, that his hand was over and hid a mistake in some of the figures, so that none could see it until his hand was removed. And of course, what one of the things that we're saying here is, the Lord is now removing his hand from some of the figures on this chart. He removed his hand from some of the figures right there at the great, uh, great disappointment. They uh, had already come to understand that Miller calculating 1843 for the end of the 2300 years, they, they understood that one right away. But what we're suggesting is that the Lord is now removing his hand from the 2520 um, in the fullest sense. But the early writings continues on. It says, Then I saw in relation to the daily that the word sacrifice was supplied by man's wisdom and does not belong to the text, and that the Lord gave the correct view of it to those who gave the judgment hour cry. When union existed before 1844, nearly all were united on the correct view of the daily, but in the confusion since 1844, other views have been embraced, and darkness and confusion have followed. Time has not been a test since 1844, and it never will be again again be a test. Now, brothers and sisters, if you look at the modern historians, they will go to this passage, what we just read, and they will insist that the only thing that Sister White is saying in what we just read is that there'll be no more time prophecies. And that's what they say. You can go read it. And I'll tell you what, she's saying so much more than simply uh, time is not ever going to be a test again. Um, she says that the Lord gave the correct view of the daily to the people that gave the judgment hour cry, that the Lord um, is the one that directed the formation of this chart, that he held his hand over some of the figures, but it, this chart should not be altered. She's saying many things in there. Um, she says that um, a different understanding of the daily than what those that gave the judgment hour cry possessed, that different understanding brings darkness and confusion. That's what she says. But in any case... This is the endorsement in early writings concerning this chart. And then in your notes, you'll see Habakkuk 2, 1 through 4, which is the passage that the Millerites came, were confronted with and um, convicted to prepare this chart. And it says this, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. And the Lord answered me and said, write the complete vision. Now, Habakkuk doesn't say complete vision, but we spent some time identifying that there are two words in the book of Daniel that are translated vision. One means the complete vision, and one means the mare vision. And this word chauzon means complete vision, and that's what Habakkuk is talking about. And that's why the Millerites were correct. They put the whole story on this chart. They were dealing with the the powers that trample down God's people over the years. That's the child's own vision. Pagan Rome, papal Rome, Islam, it's all there, the complete vision. Write the complete vision and make it plain upon tables. That's the phrase they were convicted of to make this chart. Write, write the Millerite message and make it plain upon this chart, upon a table. That he may run that readeth it. For the complete vision, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak, and not lie, though it tarry. Wait for it, because it will surely come. 
it will not tarry. Behold, his soul, which is lifted up, is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. Our premise here, uh, the argument that we're setting forth that we're trying to nail down from this point on, is that the Millerite time period is repeated again to the very letter at the end of the world, and therefore, there comes a point in time in the history that is being repeated when this passage in Habakkuk will become present truth once again. And it's our contentions that uh, we have reached that time, and um, the similar circumstances connected with this passage apply here at the end of the world, that it is our responsibility as Seventh-day Adventists at the end of the world to once again clearly set forth the vision where those that will read it can take this understanding and run with it. And it is our contention that in the Bible and spirit of prophecy, it is very clearly and soundly demonstrated that the final truce of Adventism must be built upon the foundational truce of Adventism. And it is not an accident that the foundational truce of Adventism on, are on this chart and therefore, we're suggesting that some of the final truths of Adventism that we must understand, that we may run and take this message to the world, are developed from the correct understanding of this chart. And therefore, this chart, once again, is present truth. And it brings with it an urgency because Habakkuk and Ezekiel 12, which we're going to read in a minute, are emphasizing that when you finally reach the point in the history, whether it's the Millerite history or our history that's repeating the Millerite history, when you finally reach the point where Habakkuk 2 and Ezekiel 12 are once again understood to be present truth in connection with this chart, that there's no more tarrying time. The vision is going to come, and the vision for us here at the end is the third angel's message, a warning against the mark of the beast, and it is identifying the Sunday law in the United States. That's the, the starting point for the, the third angel's message swelling into a loud cry. The other passage of present truth um, to the Millerites, which Sister White identifies and speaks about, is on the next quote on the page from Ezekiel 12. It says, Son of man, what is the proverb that ye have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every complete vision faileth? Now, brothers and sisters, the vision of the Millerites was that unto 2,300 days then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. They believed the Lord was returning in 1843 and then 1844. That's, that's the vision. And the whole world was saying, ah, you know, the Lord's not returning yet. That, that was the, the proverb in the land is this isn't going to happen in 1843. This isn't going to happen in 1844. But in our day and age, the, the proverb is, is, you know, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand Stand there's going to be a Sunday law at some point in time. But we're not at that point in time yet. It's, it's not going to happen yet. It's, we've still got some time. There was, I had been invited one time to do a, a camp meeting in Canada. And uh, the French-speaking part of Canada, so they had part of the camp meeting going on in French and part in English. And they had a general conference employee there that was from Europe that was speaking French. And I had people going to his meeting, and, and they would come to our meeting, and afterwards I started having brothers and sisters coming up and saying, you know, I'm hearing what you're saying, and what you're, say, you're leading me to believe that the Sunday law is like five, ten years off, but this guy over here, he's telling us that the Sunday law is at least 200 years away. And I, I'm saying, well, you know, that's a big enough difference that brothers and sisters, you need to figure out which emphasis is correct. Perhaps we're both wrong, but uh, Ezekiel 12 says, Son of man, what is the proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying the days are prolonged and every complete vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, thus saith the Lord God, I will make this proverb to cease, and they shall no more use it as a proverb in Israel. But say unto them, the days are at hand, and the effect of every vision, for there shall no more any vain vision nor flattering divination within the house of Israel. No more be. Be no more any. For I am the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged, for in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, 
and will perform it, saith the Lord God. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, behold, they, are the, they of the house of Israel say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come, and he prophesieth of times that are far off. Therefore say unto them, Thus saith the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done, saith the Lord God. Now, brothers and sisters, what I'm saying, what I'm understanding, what I'm trying to set forth, is that this passage in Ezekiel and the passage in Habakkuk are directly related to the Millerite time period. These were the passages that they understood in connection with the development of this chart, and they understood in connection with the tarrying time. And therefore, if we're going to repeat the Millerite time period again to the very letter, as inspiration tells us, there comes a point where once again the Lord is going to reveal through these two passages of Scripture in connection with this chart that there is no more prolonging of the vision. It's about to come to pass. So, we are going to um, look at some components of this chart as we continue on in this study. On, on the next page, uh, we have Daniel 12, 11 and 12. Daniel 12, verses 11 and 12. Um, says, and from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he who waiteth and cometh to a thousand three hundred five and thirty days. Um, we've read more than once in this presentation that Sister White states very plainly that the word sacrifice in connection with the word daily in the book of Daniel does not belong there. This is a pioneer position, but I remind you of all the supplied words in the Bible, and there are probably hundreds, I don't think I'm exaggerating when I say there's hundreds of supplied words. How many of those supplied words does inspiration tell us do not belong to the text? Only one, the fact that Sister White says this word sacrifice doesn't belong in Daniel. Uh, it, it's emphasized by the fact that that's the only one she points to. So we remove that out of there, and there you see uh, Daniel 12, 11, and 12, without the word sacrifice. And we're, we're going to uphold the understanding that the people that put this chart together had on the daily, and you can uphold it not just because they said so. It is the correct understanding in the book, book of da Daniel. You can demonstrate it from the Hebrew. You can demonstrate it from history. You can de demonstrate it from the Bible. The daily represents paganism. So in your third quote there, the daily paganism, if we factor in no sacrifice and we change the word daily to paganism, it would say, and from the time that paganism shall be taken away and the abomination that make a desolate set up, there shall be a thousand two hundred and ninety days. Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the thousand three hundred and then five and thirty days. And we spent time identifying that there are two Hebrew words in the book of Daniel that are translated as take away. In Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, that Hebrew word is sir. It's, it's translated as taken away. The daily will be taken away. Paganism will be taken away. And sir, in Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11, means to take away. It means to remove. Whereas in Daniel 8.11, when it talks about the daily being taken away, that Hebrew word that's translated as take away means room, and it does not mean to take away. It means to lift up and exalt. But here we're dealing with sir, means to be removed. So on your fourth representation of these two verses, it says, and from the time that paganism shall be removed. And uh, we have spent some time with that. The fulfillment of paganism be removed is based upon the prophetic history that's set forth in Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, pagan Rome was going to disintegrate into ten kingdoms. And these ten kingdoms, in order to prepare the way for the papacy, three of the kingdoms had to be removed for the little horn of the papacy to be set up. And these three nations, the way, the, the way that they were to be removed is that the seven other European nations, these seven other kingdoms of pagan Rome, we're going to come into a church-state relationship with the papacy and dedicate their financial, financial structure and their military complexes to attacking the Hiroli, the Ostrogoths, and the Vandals, removing them, plucking them up so the papacy could take control of the world. And in the process of this combination of church and state, each of these seven European kings, beginning with Clovis in 496 and ending with the seventh, King Arthur in 508, 
their coming together in a church-state alliance included that each of them changed the legal prof religious profession of their country from paganism to Catholicism. So when Daniel 11.31 and Daniel 12.11 is talking about the daily paganism being served, being removed, it's talking about this process of from 496 to 508 where the seven European kings changed their legal profession from paganism to Catholicism. And by the year 508, paganism had been removed. And you see this reflected on this chart. This, the, this is what the pioneer position was. Here's the, the, the date 508 with the 1335 added to it on this chart. Um, we're dealing strictly now, here's the 1290 and the 1335 in relationship to 508. What we're saying here in Daniel 12, verses 11 and 12, is that from the time that paganism was removed in 508, the, and this is identifying the process of the seven European kings coming into church-state relationship with the papacy, from this time period, 508, there shall be 1,200 and 90 days, a day for a year, brings you to 1798. Um, and then it says, blessed is he who cometh to the 1335. It's same starting point. There's no way that you can grammatically separate verses 11 and 12. They are, this grammatical structure of those two verses tell you that it's the same thought. The st same starting point for the 1290 is identified in those two verses as the starting point for the 1335. And the 1335 brings you to 1843, and this is pioneer understanding, and sometimes there's a, a, a question. I'm going to throw the question up here just to make sure you understand it. In Sister White says the Lord held his hand over a, a mistake in some of the figures, and the primary mistake the Lord held his hand over here uh, in these figures is in the 2300 and the 2520 because the Millerites did not calculate the year zero. And because they didn't calculate the year zero, they came up to 1843 instead of 1844. But when you're dealing with this time prophecy, this is 508 years beyond the year zero. So there's, there's no kind of math error with the Millerites on these time prophecies. It's, it's on this side of the year zero, and it stays on this side of the year zero, so um, those dates are accurate. Though that is the pioneer understanding of um, 508 and onward. Um, if you have questions, write them down. We'll take them up afterwards so we don't get sidetracked in this, this presentation. Now, if you would, I want to show you a, an argument in that supports um, the pioneer understanding of these visions that, that is re and probably came to light in the past five years. So it's an it's a argument in their defense that is sound, but it, it flat nails it down just that much uh, more soundly than even the pioneers did. Notice that in the 1290, if you read verses 11 and 12, that let's read verses 11 and 12 so it's fresh in our mind. Top of page 74, and from the time, 508, that paganism, the daily sacrifice, shall be removed, taken away, and the abomination that maketh desolate set up. This first phrase is it's saying from the time that paganism is removed, but it doesn't stop there. It's, it's connecting the removal of paganism with the, the setting up or the placing of the papacy. So... What, what is to be understood by that is when you have this 1290-year time prophecy and it concludes when the papacy receives its deadly wound, the, the statement, and from the time that paganism is removed in order to place the papacy and set up the papacy for 1260 years, it's the same subject. The, the subject in the passage is consistent with itself. And then a second thought is, blessed is he who cometh, to 1843, to the 1335. So the first time prophecy, 1290, has a direct connection to the papacy, the setting up of the papacy. Second time prophecy has something to do with a blessing, and we will deal with that in a moment. In the life of Christ, there is a pattern 
uh, a prophetic pattern. I'm not talking about Christ's nature, his human and divine nature, or the incarnation. I'm talking about a, at the prophetic level, there is a pattern in the life of Christ. And you'll, uh, you're going to see the proof text for this. It's very easy to see this. This here, if you will, is a timeline. And we're going to put the way marks of Christ's life upon this timeline. And on page 75, it says the pattern of Christ. It says Christ was the anointed of God, yet his life was humble and without display. For 30 years of his life, there is scarcely anything on record concerning him. His quiet, unestatious life should be a lesson to parents, to guardians, to children, to youth, and even to manhood. And what I want you to see, if you will, is that the first part of Christ's life um, consists of 30 years, and we'll call this preparation. He was preparing for his work during this time period. And after 30 years, this is Waymark number one, he is anointed with the Holy Spirit. He's empowered to give his testimony. And you have a long quote here from Great Controversy, which we should be familiar with, that at this point in time, um, Christ was empowered and gave his testimony for how long? Ah, that's what everyone always says, that he gave his testimony for three and a half years. But in reality, Sister White says he gave his testimony for seven years, three and a half years personally, and then three and a half more years in the presence of his disciples. If you see this quote from Great Controversy, if you look at the, the middle paragraph, it says, and he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. The week here brought to view is the last one of the 70. It is the last seven years of the period allotted especially to the Jews during this time, extending from AD 27 to AD 34. Christ, at first in person and afterward by his disciples, extended the gospel invitation, especially to the Jews. But uh, you are right. He gave his power, his testimony for three and a half years. But we want to see this, these way marks. Here, this is the way mark here when he is empowered. And I'm just going to put power here. If we had a, a much more room, we would put power in testimony. He gave his testimony for three and a half years. And then was the cross where he died. We'll put death. And uh, after the cross, he was resurrected. Of course, we know this. We have a, um, a reference for this on the paper. We'll put resurrection here. R-E-S. That's an abbreviation. And uh, next page, a quote. The next way mark in the pattern of Christ is his ascension to heaven. That's an abbreviation. And then the, in the pattern of Christ, you have the end of the world. And the end of the world, we may not realize it, but it's, we do realize it. In AD 70, at the destruction of Jerusalem, Sister White tells us it, that the destruction of Jerusalem represents the, the collapse of uh, planet Earth just prior to the second coming of Christ. You can read it here. And then we have the second coming of Christ illustrated in the life of Christ. This one is not so um, widely recognized by Adventists, but Sister White says very plainly in that quote that when Christ came to John on the Isle, Isle of Patmos, it represented his second coming. We can read this, bottom of page 76. In the days of the early Christians, Christ came the second time. His first advent was at Bethlehem when he was an infant, his second advent was at the Isle of Patmos when he revealed himself in glory to John the Revelator who fell at his feet as dead. So what, I'm, what I want you to see, this is simple. If you've never seen, recognized it before, it may seem a little bit complex, but it really is simple. You see in a moment. In the life of Christ, there is a prophetic pattern that he sets forth. 30 years of preparation. Then he's empowered when when he's anointed with the Holy Spirit, once he's empowered, he gives his testimony for three and a half years, which concludes then with his death on the cross. Then he's resurrected, then he ascends to heaven. And then in AD 70, we see the, the representation of the end of the world, the chaos at the end of the world. And then at the Isle of Patmos in the year 100, the second 
coming of Christ. Everyone see that pattern? That's pretty simple, right? Okay. There's more to add into that pattern. Um, but the Bible says, upon the testimony of two or three, his thing is established. And you can show this pattern probably at minimum of five different places in the Bible. We're just going to look at a, a couple to establish it and, uh, and then draw some conclusions from it. If you, you don't need to turn to Revelation 13 if you have a, or Revelation 11 if you have a syllabus. But in Revelation 11, we have the story, we have several themes in Revelation 11, but one of those themes is the Bible, the Word of God and the persecution that took place against the Word of God during the French Revolution time period. And you'll find that the Bible, of course, is a type of Christ. And in Revelation 11, this identical sequence of events is set forth. And the only thing is, is that the preparation time period, it's not identified in Revelation 11, but it doesn't have to be. When we bring a line of prophecy together with another line of prophecy, it is not a problem if one of the waymarks is missing. What, the problem, when we bring two lines of prophecy together, uh, the, if, if there's going to be a problem, the problem is that the sequence, if the sequence is out of order, you know that you're misapplying something. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that Daniel chapter 8 is a vision that identifies the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. But Daniel chapter 8, uh, what's the first kingdom of Bible prophecy in Daniel chapter 8? Medo-Persia. But we know from Daniel 2 and Daniel 7 that the first kingdom of Bible prophecy is Babylon. And so even though Daniel 8 starts with Medes and Persians, we don't stumble over that. You know, why isn't Babylon in Daniel chapter 8? There's something wrong here. We know that Babylon is the first kingdom of Bible prophecy has already been established. So when we come to the pattern of Christ in Revelation 11, in terms of the Bible being a type of Christ, we don't see the first way mark of the preparation, but we see everything else. If you look in your notes, if we start verses 3 through 6, it says, in the Seventh-day Adventists, we know the two witnesses in Daniel or in Revelation 11 is the Old and New Testament. And it says, and I will give power unto my two witnesses. And they shall prophesy how long? A thousand two hundred and three score days. What is that? It's three and a half prophetic years. He's going to empower the Bible. He's going to empower Christ. Christ is the word of God, right? And he's going to give his testimony for the identical time period. Uh, they, they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two candlesticks standing before the God of the earth, and if any man will hurt them, fire proceed out of their mouth and devour their enemies. And if any man will hurt them, he must in this manner be killed. These have power to shut heaven that it rain not in the days of their prophecy and have power over the waters to turn them to blood and to smite the earth with all plagues as often as they will. So in the time of Christ, he's empowered when he's 30 years old. He gives his testimony for three and a half years. And then what happens? He dies. And in Revelation 11... If you look at the, the next verses, 9 through 10, it says, And when they have finished their testimony, and their testimony was for three and a half years, but the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them, shall overcome them, and kill them. There's the death right there, right on time, right on schedule. And their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified. Was Christ crucified in Sodom and Egypt? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes and no. The Bible says he was crucified in, Sodom, in Egypt, so the, the Bible's never wrong. But what the Bible is teaching us here is that this is a prophetic illustration. It's, it's lining up the very pattern that we're, we're identifying, identifying. It's saying if we're going to understand the history of the French Revolution in terms of its attack upon the Bible, the Old and New Testament, that history has been illustrated by the life of Christ, who is the Word of God, but in order to understand it, we must understand it prophetically, symbolically. Christ died in Jerusalem, not Sodom and Egypt. Um, and that's what, what John is saying. To understand this correctly, you're looking for a symbolic fulfillment of it. And they of the people and kindreds and tongues and nations shall see their dead bodies three, and a, three days and a half and shall not suffer their dead bodies to be put in graves. And they that dwell 
on the earth shall rejoice over them and make merry and shall send gifts one to another because these two prophets tormented them that dwell upon the earth. The next thing that happens in the life of Christ is resurrection. And the next verse, verse 11 says, And after three days and a half, the spirit of, of life from God entered into them, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. They were resurrected, right on target. The next verse says, and they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. You see the pattern. It's, it's point for point, the identical pattern. Do you see it? And then in the next verse it says, In the same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven, if most Seventh-day Adventists here at the end of the world, that when they read that verse, they go, I don't really know what that means. But if you go back to the pioneers of Adventism, they knew what that meant, and they were right on. Uh, a city in Bible prophecy, you can, you can probably bring 20 verses to prove this from the book of Revelation alone. A city in Bible prophecy is a kingdom. So in this verse, when it says, a tenth part of the city fell, it's talking about a kingdom. So what kingdom in Bible prophecy was divided into 10. Pagan Rome was divided into 10 parts, Daniel chapter 7. This is how the pioneers understood this verse. And this verse is saying that there's an earthquake. It's not going to destroy all 10 of those kingdoms. It's going to destroy one of those 10 kingdoms. And the pioneers say that this earthquake was the French Revolution. And of course, this is what Revelation 11 is all about. And the pioneers say that France was one of those 10 kingdoms of the descendants of pagan Rome, and that this verse is talking about the French Revolution. The earthquake is identifying the French Revolution that took place in France. And sure enough, what does Sister White say about the French Revolution? It represents the same thing that the destruction of Jerusalem represents. It represents the chaos and anarchy that takes place during the seven last plague time period as the world is falling apart just before the return of Jesus. So right on target, if you understand prophecy as the pioneers of Adventism do, you see the very next waymark illustrated. And then in the next verse, it says, The second woe is past, and behold, the third woe cometh quickly. And if you get into the pioneer writings, what do the pioneers teach about the third woe? It's the escalating catastrophes brought on by Islam. They don't teach that, but they build the case for that. That lead to what? to the second coming of Christ. So, when it comes to the pattern of Christ, there is a sequence of events set forth in the life of Christ. And in Revelation 11, which is dealing with the Bible, the Old and New Testament, and Christ is the Word of God, the identical sequence is there. The Bible says, Upon the testimony of two, a thing shall be established. And there are other places to demonstrate this pattern, but we just want to look at one. And the reason that we're looking at one is to bring an argument on 508 in support of the pioneers that the pioneers did not recognize and that, in my mind, closes the, the door against an argument against 508. And it is this. One of the things that took place in the life of Christ, and we understand this correctly as Seventh-day Adventists, is there was a change in dispensations going on. What do I mean by a dispensation? Sister White says that John the Baptist was a connecting link between two dispensations. John the Baptist was one of four prophets in all of history that were connecting link prophets between two dispensations. What was the first thing that John the Baptist said when he seen Christ? Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. John the Baptist was the connecting link between the dispensation of worship in the earthly sanctuary and the worship in the heavenly sanctuary. He was a prophet raised up um, to change the focus of worship for God's people from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. In the time period of Christ, this change of dispensations was taking place from from earthly sanctuary to heavenly sanctuary, from old covenant to new covenant. I mean, there's several places where the scriptures emphasize, you know, the, 
the change that was going on. So I want you to see, if you will, that although we're just touching on it lightly, that in the pattern of Christ, one of the things that was taking place is a change of dispensations. Just so you'll know, get it fastened down in your mind what change of dispensation is, if, if, if it helps. Noah was one of these connecting link prophets. Uh, inspiration tells us that before the flood, the focus of worship for God's people was the Garden of Eden. Uh, at the gates of the Garden of Eden, the cherubims had the sword with the flaming fire. That was where God's true people before the flood looked for the focus of worship. In fact, the, the word that's translated flame and the flaming swords there in the story in Genesis, that is the root word for Shekinah. So the Shekinah's presence was at the gates of the Garden of Eden. But after the flood, the focus of worship was no longer the Garden of Eden, it was altars, and that's why the very first thing that Noah did after the flood was build an altar. Noah was a prophet, a dispensational prophet, a connecting link prophet that was used to change the focus of worship from the Garden of Eden to altars. The next connecting link prophet was Moses. Moses was used to take the worship from altars to the earthly sanctuary. From A change of dispensation that took place at the flood, took place in the days of Moses, and when it was time to change the focus of worship from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary, John the Baptist, that's why Sister White says John the Baptist is a connecting link between two dispensations. So Noah, Moses, John the Baptist are connecting link prophets. There's only one other, and that's Ellen White, because she was raised up to change the focus of worship from the holy place to the most holy place. So when it comes to the inspiration of Ellen White, let's remember that she stands in a group that's consists of Noah, Moses, and John the Baptist. Kind of a special group. But in the days of Christ, there was a change of dispensations. You follow the logic there, and it's very sustainable and usually easily understood by Seventh-day Adventists. Another pattern of Christ, and this is the one that we want to look at, is the pattern of Antichrist. If you look closely at the Antichrist in Bible prophecy, you find that he is prophetically governed by this pattern, by this pattern. Um, and there was a preparation time period identified, a time to prepare for the papacy to take control of the world. And that preparation time began in 508. How many years do you suppose the preparation time lasted? Identical with Christ. It lasted 30 years because in 538, the papacy was empowered. You notice up here, the pioneers mark off this 30 years as the setting up of the papacy. 508 to 538 parallels the 30 years of preparation of Christ. And then on 538, what was the papacy? It was empowered, right, to do what? to give its satanic testimony. And how long did it give its testimony for? Three and a half prophetic years, which took it to where? 1798. And what happened to the papacy in 1798? It received the deadly wound. It died right on time, right on time. Right at the same point that Christ this is on the cross, the papacy receives its deadly wound. This is, a, this, is a, this is at a prophetic level. What are we waiting for now prophetically? The, rest, the resurrection for the deadly wound of the papacy to be healed. And you'll see some quotes in here. We're just walking through this. Um, on page 79, the... Um, maybe you'll see a quote where when the papacy's deadly wound is healed, then it is going to ascend up before the whole world. And then, of course, the fall of Babylon takes place and the seven last plagues and the second coming of Christ. Now, the difference with the, the Antichrist pattern is simply that the complete pattern is already established by Christ in past history. The history of the Old and New Testament in the French Revolution is past history. The history of the Antichrist is halfway finished, but the last part of it is still future. But according to prophecy, every one of the waymarks 
is in the correct order and is just ahead. The next thing to happen is the resurrection. The deadly wound of the papacy is about to be healed. And as it is healed, the papacy is going to ascend to the throne of the earth. And in that same time period that the loud cry message is going forth, which is Babylon has fallen, Babylon will fall fully and completely. Michael will stand up and the seven last plagues will be poured out, which is symbolic of the destruction of Jerusalem and the French Revolution um, in past history. And it all culminates with the second coming of Christ. So, when you, when you factor in that in the days of Christ, there was a change of dispensations, and you come down here to the pattern of Antichrist, you realize that just exactly like Christ, that in this time period that the papacy's, the preparation for the papacy taking control of the world, there is a change in satanic dispensations. The satanic religion that had been in the world prior to 538 was paganism. But there was a change in dispositions taking place, and the, the premier satanic religion was to become not paganism, but papalism. The Antichrist is following the pattern of Christ perfectly. And as you draw these patterns out, you realize suddenly that the year 508 and the 30 years of preparation it does nothing but just soundly confirm the pioneer position of 508, the 1290, the 1335, which of course is reflected upon the 1843 chart, which of course very few Seventh-day Adventists know anything about any longer here at the end of the world. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, as we look around planet Earth today, we see that the deadly wound of the papacy is very soon to be healed and that troublous times, times which Sister White says no human pen can describe, troublous times are just before us and that we have a preparation to make in our personal experiences and in our homes and in our churches that we can be about our business of Sounding out this final warning message, we ask that you would use this prophetic light, this information to convict us of this work of preparation that we need to do. Help us to awaken and uh, be about our business of awakening others, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.